So, when I was, hold on, let me get it going in the right direction here. When I was in junior high, I was way into radio controlled cars. Like, I loved it. It was fun and I saved up my money. In fact, the first big thing that I ever purchased with my very own money was a radio controlled car. In fact, I didn't even shop around for it. I went to KB Toy and I bought the very first radio controlled car that I found. And it was not anything like this. It was about this big and it would go and it would get about from me to Leighton back there and all of a sudden it would just stop and I'd have to walk a little bit closer to it and I'd make it go again and, get, and it would hit things like a crack in the sidewalk and stop. <laughs> and I was a little disillusioned. Meanwhile, my next door neighbor, Daniel, he bought one like this. This thing has variable speed motor, it's got giant tires, it could run over Jack, and it could just, nothing was going to stop this thing. It was awesome. But one of the things that this has that mine doesn't have is multiple channels. See, if you're going to take this to a place where there's a bunch of other uh, radio controlled cars, I can switch the channel on the remote and on the car so that I don't interfere with anybody else's. Well, my friend Daniel's truck, because it was way better than mine, he had multiple channels. Guess what one of his channels was the same as? Yours. Mine. So, because he's a funny guy, I'd be driving my car around, and he'd go, and all of a sudden, my car's running into walls, and I'm like, hey, what's going on here? And, you know, and I'm chasing it around. I'm trying to get it to stop, and it's not stopping. I'm all over the place. And Daniel was able to switch his frequency to my frequency and completely take control of my car. And while that was really frustrating, he thought it was great, and it was awesome. And it, it also came in handy when I lost my controller in my messy bed. How many of you have a messy bedroom? Can you feel my pain? My controller disappeared somewhere in my, in my room, and he was able to control my car once again. But it was one of those things where he could change the chant, his frequency, and he could absolutely take control of my car. Now, we're in this series called Life or Death, and Life or death, we're looking at the 6th, 7th, and 8th chapters of a letter that a guy named Paul wrote to Christians in Rome. Anybody know what this letter is called in the Bible? What book of the Bible it is? Romans. Romans. He wrote it to the Christians in Romans, encouraging them in their faith, helping them to know the truths of God and how they're called to live their life. And this, tr this series is called Life or Death because he lays out these changes that happen when we receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, when we ask Jesus to be the Lord of our life. Now, long before Paul talked about life or death, God told us what his hope for our life is. Way back in the book of Deuteronomy, can you say Deuteronomy? Because when else do you get to say that word, right? Deuteronomy. So I was reading Deuteronomy the other day. Or I was looking through my Deuteronomy, and people are going to think you have some strange disease. But in Deuteronomy, God said this, Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. So we have a what? We have a choice. And we've been talking about this over the last few weeks, and I want us to remember that because sometimes we sort of feel like we don't have a choice, right? Sometimes it feels like life gets so hard that we're tempted to go, well, what else could I do? Or this is just who I am. But we have a choice, and I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose what? Life. Say it like you mean it. Oh, that you would choose? Life. Oh, that you would choose life. God is going, please. You, yes, you have good things and bad things in front of you all the time. Choose the good. 
You have things that are going to be healthy for your life, that are going to bring blessings to your life, and there are going to be things that are going to be unhealthy and are going to bring curses on your life. Please, please, please choose what? Life. life. God is rooting for us. And that's the other thing that I want you to remember and stick in your brain. In those times when life gets tough or you have all these temptations or these choices in front of you, one, you have a choice. And two, God is on your side. God is rooting for you to have life. God is not setting you up to screw up, to be a knucklehead, to make a bad choice so he can smash you with a giant God hammer. That's not, what, that's not what's going on. God is going, please, please, in the name of me, choose life. Because that is how you're going to get closer to me. That is how you're going to be blessed. All of these things in life that you have before you, you have a choice. And I'm rooting for you. And I want you to choose life because it's going to be good for you. So then we get back to this letter that Paul wrote to the Romans. And I get to chapter six of this letter starting in verse eight, and I start thinking about radio-controlled cars. It was the first thing that popped into my head as I'm reading this, I'm like, and, and we're gonna read it in just a second, but radio-controlled cars. They did not have radio-controlled cars when Paul wrote this, so I don't think he had that in mind. But this was the thing that just came to my mind and how my friend Daniel could do what he did with his car. So we're gonna read this together. And I want you to follow along and see what sticks out to you, all right? It says this, And since we died with Christ, we know we also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. Now, last week we talked about, we defined sin. Anybody remember what, how we defined sin? Not a hypothetical question. Anybody? What is sin? Bad stuff. Bad stuff. What's sin? Um, purposely going against God. Purposely going against God. What else? See, sin's this churchy word that we can easily throw around, but really, do we really know what it means? Sin? Anything that dishonors God? An action that defies God? Any other input? Huh? Murder would be sin. Okay, here it is. Anything that is against God's plan, the command, or design for our lives. So it doesn't have to be like, oh yes, I worshiped Satan the other day. Okay, it can be your attitude with your mom or dad. It could be the way you gossiped about somebody behind their back so that it would make you feel better or make you look better. It could be some, some thought or some anger or that it, anything that is against God's plan, command, or design for our lives. That's what sin is. So here it says, we have died with Christ. We will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. The result of sin is what? Death. Death. The result of sin, us living against God, the result of that is death. Well, here it says sin or death has no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. So sin was this big, powerful thing. Ways that we live against God. And with sin, we get separated from God. Separation from God is hell. And whatever word picture you want to use, if you look in scripture, it defines it as a fiery lake. It defines it as a place of torture and suffering, just this awful thing. All of that, hell is separation from God. That's what makes that hellish. And sin, living against God, cannot coexist with God. And so when we choose to sin, it separates us from God. But Jesus came and he goes, look, I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to offer you an opportunity to have life. Remember, place before you blessings and curses, life and death. Choose what? Life. Choose Jesus. Because that 
is how we get out of the punishment that's waiting for those who live in a way that is against God's plan, command, or design for our lives. It's only through Jesus. You can't be good enough because if you've screwed up, how many of you have screwed up in your life? Dead. You're all done for. But with Jesus, if we will put our faith in Jesus, then God sees Jesus rather than the stuff that should separate us. So this says, when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. What Jesus did was the same thing that my friend Daniel did with his radio-controlled car. Jesus came and he switched the frequency. And he said, hey, I now have the power. I now have the ability, the ability to take your life, which was headed this direction, and you kept trying to catch up and you kept trying to control it the best you could and you kept trying to do your thing, but inevitably it was never good enough. My car was never good enough. I think I drove it five times before I, before I was just like, whatever, this is lame. Our life is never good enough. My car was never good enough. So Jesus came and he goes, look, I'm gonna change the channel. I'm gonna switch the frequency. And now if you will follow me, I will be able to be in control. I will break the power that you had that wasn't good enough and I can control you. I can, I can guide your life to Christ. I can guide your life, your, your life to life. But you have to let me. You have to give me that authority in your life. That is called being the Lord of your life. See, it's easy to call ourselves Christians, right? A lot of times people go, Oh yeah, I'm Christian. I've been to church on Easter. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I haven't murdered anybody. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. And we, we take on this name Christian, kind of like a name badge. But a real Christian, an authentic Christian, is one who allows Jesus to control their life, to guide their life. They've allowed Jesus to switch the frequency on their life, and it looks radically different. Their life is under a completely different control. How many of you have a habit that you wish you could break? Raise your hand. How many of you, in some way, you've messed up in, in your life and it's been hurtful to others? It's been hurtful to you? Raise your hand. In some way, you've hurt other people by the way you've lived. All right. How many of you, in some way, you know... Something is not what God would have for you. It's not part of God's plan. It's not okay with God. And yet you just have kind of written it off and gone, I don't know if I can be different, but you wish you could be different. Anybody? I'm all three of those things. Absolutely. All kinds of things in my life, I'm just like, oh. And sometimes we feel stuck. Sometimes we end up in this mindset of just going, well, that's who I am. That's what I'm going to be. And what this verse is saying, when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. Here is the truth for your life and mine. God has the power to set you free. And right now, if in your mind you're thinking, yeah, but not this thing in my life. Yes, that thing in your life. Because earlier it said, we are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. Death no longer has power over Jesus. Jesus is greater than any death, than any sin that's in your life. Any way that you feel like you just can't help it, any way that you feel like you're just, it's too much for you to handle, any way that you feel like your habit is too ingrained or your thoughts are just too off, off to the left or whatever it is. Here it says, death no longer has power over Jesus. That means Jesus has the power to set you free. And I read that and I go, thank you, Jesus, because I would be a mess. Death no longer has power over Jesus. That means that if we take Jesus, if we choose Jesus, and allow him to be the Lord of our life. If we surrender those habits, 
We surrender those actions. We surrender those mindsets, those thoughts, those attitudes, and we go, God, change me. Guess what? He can. He can set you free. He can set me free. It doesn't mean we won't struggle. It doesn't mean we won't be tempted. Because remember, we've got blessing and curses, life and death put before us every day. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be those things that our flesh, that our brokenness rises up and goes, hey, yeah, that would probably feel pretty good. What it means is that we don't have to choose those things. You're not hopeless. You're not out of options. Jesus is your option to get out of those things, to be able to escape those things. And all that Satan, who just wants to kill, steal, and destroy you, all the things that he would try and put on your life, all the things that he would try and convince you of, can be defeated. Because Jesus defeated them. We're no longer stuck. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. So considering yourself dead, think of something in your life that you struggle with right now. Again, maybe it's an attitude. Something that you know is like, this is not good. This is not part of God's plan for me. This is not an action or an attitude that I should continue. We all have them, by the way. So no one sitting here is exempt from this. Think of something in your life and you, that you struggle with, that you're just like, eh, maybe it's an attitude, an action, whatever it may be. What is your mindset toward that thing? Is it no big deal? Have you written it off as, hey, who cares? What's the big deal? If you have... Maybe you don't know what God has called you to. Maybe you don't know the life that God has for you. Maybe you don't understand the standard that God calls you to live by, not so that you can be a good Christian, but so you can be alive. Or maybe you've written it off because it's just been too hard a fight and you don't want to have to struggle with it anymore. And so you justify it. You make it, oh, uh, well, it's fine. It's not that big a deal. But deep in your heart, you know it is a big deal. So how do we live in freedom? What is this? How are we supposed to be dead to the power of sin and alive through Jesus? Well, let's read on. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Have you ever done something you knew it was going to be painful, but you did it anyway? You awake? You awake? You with me? Okay. You ever done something where you knew that it was going to hurt, but you're like, oh, okay, let's go for it, right? Junior high and high school was full of this for me. We, we did all kinds of, and I know you guys do it too, but now when you come up to me, you're like, hey, Joe, <laughs> Let me give you an Indian burn. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> I'm not going to let you hurt me. Now I say that. Did I let it happen in junior high and high school? Absolutely. All right, go ahead. Ah! I still have a scar. Which hand's it on? Which? It's right. It would be, oh, it's right there. I still have a scar. It's about that long. Don't try this. I'm not giving you an idea because it really hurts, but we used to go and let our friends use an eraser on our hands. Oh, you guys, knew, you guys still do this? This is still around? So they take, and it was just like, how long can you stand it? Guys, I still have a scar from seventh grade where I let this kid named Billy Take that industrial eraser, not the kind that's attached to a pencil, but that thick one that will last you from like first through fourth grade, right? Took that, and he just sits there, and I'm like, oh, 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 stop me. And he's like, no, you can do it. Ah! I still have a scar from that. I am an idiot. Anytime I wonder, it's like, oh, yeah, I was probably pretty clever when I was in junior high or high school. I, I'm ridiculous. I have no sense at all, right? So... We knew it would hurt. We knew it would leave a mark. 
but we let it happen anyway. Or we choose that anyway. So Paul, here in this letter to these Christians, these people who call themselves Christians, these people who believe in Jesus and put their faith in Jesus, he has to tell them this straight up. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. That is basically the equivalent of you want to know how to live in freedom? You want to know how to live for Jesus? Don't give in to the stuff that's against Jesus. Now, that's easy to say, right? Like, stand up there. like, come on, guys. Just stop it. Right now. Just stop it. Stop. Stop it. If you have a bad thought about something, stop it. You're getting frustrated with your parents. You want to just call them poo-poo heads. Stop it. You hate your brother and sister. Stop that right now. Just stop it. What? What? All of you could just nod your head and be like, okay, Jeff. All right. Thanks for the pep talk there, pal. It is only through the power of what that we can be free from sin. Jesus. I'll ask you again because I know more of you know the answer. It is only through the power of what Jesus. that we can... Jesus. It's only through God's power. It's only when we give our lives to him that we have any hope of being set free from the stuff that wrecks our life. It's not trying hard. It's not just, oh, well, I'll try and be a better person. You can't be a better person. You're a knucklehead. It's not just, all right, I'm just going to be really disciplined. No, you're not. Because your body and your flesh and your mind is all wacky and, and you're going to end up giving into it. It's not about you just trying harder. And trust me, in 38 years, I've tried harder a lot. Doug, have you tried harder a lot? Carlo, have you tried harder a lot? Anybody in here, has anybody in here not tried harder? If anybody was going to raise their hand, I was going to be like, we'll try harder. <laughs> but it, that, it's not about us trying harder. It's about us going, God, I am so broken. I am so messed up. I'm, my mind is twisted and my opinions of things are distorted and my body and my emotions are just way out there. I need you to set me free. I need you to help me not give in to sin, not to let sin control me. Because there are so many times and opportunities where we have life and death, blessings and curses set before us, and we're just like, oh, here's the sin mobile. <laughs> and we just let it control us, and it drives us all over the place. We're just like, sin, 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 sin. You know, we drive to Sin City. You know, we just go all, <laughs> we, we go everywhere. It's not about us trying harder. But here, Paul just lays it out. He goes, don't let sin control the way you live. Don't give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. That is such a powerful way to consider. Don't let any part of your body become an instrument of sin. Is your brain part of your body? Is your mouth part of your body? Your ability to speak part of your body? your legs and your feet and your arms, parts of your body, okay? Don't let any of it give in. Don't let your thumb that controls the remote control be an instrument of sin by taking you places on TV you don't need to be. Don't let your thumbs that control your smartphone take you anywhere on the World Wide Web that you shouldn't be. Don't let your mouth say anything about another person that you don't need to say that's not going to be of love, that's not going to show them the love of Jesus. He just lays it out there. Don't give in to it. And you know it's coming, right? We, we know and we choose. And here he reminds us, Jesus has the power to break that in you. If you're here today and you're a liar, Jesus has the power to break that in you. If you're here today and you're a gossiper, 
Jesus has the power to break that in you. If you're here today and anger and rage is something that you just wrestle with and you are just a volcano ready to explode all the time and sometimes you explode, Jesus has the power to break that in you. If you're in here today and looking at another girl or another guy is something you wrestle with and you struggle with the, your thoughts about them, Jesus has the power to break that in you, to free us from, to free us from that. It doesn't mean we're not going to have the temptations. It's not going to mean we're not going to struggle sometimes. And, but he can break the power sin has over our life. And here he's saying, don't give in to sin. How do we not give in to sin? I mean, he said that. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. I've told you guys this before. Maybe it's been on a Wednesday night or a Sunday. I don't remember. But take every thought captive to the authority of Christ. If it's not of Christ, if it's not of Jesus, then take captive that thought and don't, and, and don't just let it come flying out. Don't let it set you into action. And there have been times in my life where I have had to verbally say, I take that thought captive in the name of Jesus because it's that strong and I know that if I just kind of keep it in my head, I'm mean, like, I'm gonna, well, but once isn't gonna be a problem. It, it wasn't that bad a thing. It's not gonna be that bad a thing to say. It's not that dirty of a joke. It's not whatever it is. Take every thought captive to the authority of Christ. That word captive in the original language, in the original Greek language, that thought captive means to hostily take it over. Aggressively. It's a hostile takeover of a thought that is not of God. Do you do that? Or do you just kind of let it roam around in your mind and sometimes you're able to forget about it, but other times it's the thing that drives you right to it. Here he's saying, don't let sin control you. Don't let the, and, and so, so many times we let it because we believe that there's nothing we can do about it. Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just like this. I'm just an angry person. And we profess those things over ourselves. We declare those things over our lives. We own those things. Well, I don't know. I just... I like people to pay attention to me, so I just make stuff up. And it's, I know it's a lie, but what, who cares? It's just who I am. And we just own that stuff. And we believe that one, God's okay with it. Or two, that there's nothing we can do about it. And guys, this is a serious thing. And I, and I realize it's kind of a heavy, it's like, whoa, Jeff, why couldn't we just talk about Disneyland or something? But this is a big deal, you guys. Because if you are here today and you're living convinced that there's nothing you can do about the stuff that you're wrestling with, you're believing a lie. And if you're believing a lie right now, you're going to believe a lie when you're 18 and when you're 26 and when you're 34 and when you're 47 and when you're 60. Because Satan's just going to keep telling you that lie. And if you believe right now that you can't be set free, it's going to be even harder for you to believe it later on. And later on in your life, when you mess up, Satan's going to try and convince you that you can't be set free. So if you can get this now, if I can get this now, we can move to life. Jesus has the power to set you free. I don't care what you're struggling with. I don't care how, how deep you are into it. I don't care how much of a habit it is. You can be set free from it. It's promised. Because Jesus defeated it. It wasn't just Jesus. Oh, Jesus died on the cross, rose again. Let's have Easter. That means our lives can be completely different. He changed the frequency so that we can now be guided by him rather than our sin, rather than our thoughts and our emotions and, and all the things that mess us up. Verse 13. Instead... Nope. Now I've messed it up. Verse 13. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right 
for the glory of God. Look at this. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Sin is no longer your master. Wouldn't you rather declare that than there's nothing I can do about it? I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose what? Choose what? Choose life. Sin is no longer your master. Well, I've just been doing this habit for way too long. Which one do you want to choose? Sin is lo no longer my master. Sin is no longer my master. Or, well, this is just who I am. I guess I have to deal with it. Which one do you want to choose? Sin is no longer my master. And you have a chance today. You have a chance tomorrow and the next day and the next day because of God's grace to choose life. So would you bow your heads? And the reason we bow our heads is not because that's like the religious posture and God only listens to you if you're facing the carpet, but it's just a way to not be distracted because maybe it's just the ADD in me, but if I've got my eyes open and I'm looking around, you know, I'm looking at Caitlin's hair and I'm looking at Kate's glasses and I'm wondering what David's thinking. And I'm, you know, just, so just bow your heads. Nothing I'm going to do is going to require you knowing what's going on in the room and I promise not to throw water balloons at you. What is the sin that you have been allowing to control your life? What is the sin that you have been allowing to be your master? Because right now, Jesus can change the frequency. Jesus can set you free from it. And it may be a thing he does over time where you continue to surrender your thoughts or your actions to him and you just, it's, it's just a process of him working it out of you or it may be miraculous. Like my friend Matt who was absolutely addicted to drugs and one day was able to just stop because he surrendered it to Jesus. But I'm telling every one of you in this room, Jesus can set you free. But you need to say no to the enemy who wants to keep you wrapped up in your mess. You need to say no to the things, those thoughts in your head of just like, well, this is who you are, you're stuck. You need to say no in the name of Jesus to the lies that Satan tells you that there's nothing you can do about it or that this is just who you are and it's okay and you just have to stay the same. Jesus can set you free. Take a minute and begin taking that to God. Maybe this is the first time you've ever considered this. And maybe you still need to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And to do that, you just need to confess that you need him and ask for his forgiveness and ask him to come be the Lord of your life. And he promises to do that. If you're here, you've been to youth group over and over and over again. You've been to camp. But you've still been believing the lies. And you're not living free. God wants to set you free today. So God, I come to you along with everybody else in this room. And I declare that I have sinned. I have lived against your plan for my life, your command on my life. I have not let you be the Lord of my life. And I need to be free. And God, I pray 
for every person in this room and whatever issue they're dealing with, whatever sin they have allowed to be the master of their life, whatever lie they have continued to believe and they have just spoken over their lives over and over or let other people speak over their lives over and over, I pray that you would set them free, God. Because we believe that greater are you that's in us than anything that's in the world, than anything that could try and come against us. So God, set us free this morning. Show us your love and your grace. And God, I pray that you would be real to us. God, I, I know there are people here who are just not even sure if you're real. I pray that you would make yourself known to them in an undeniable way. God, bring life. Shower us with your life, with your hope and with your forgiveness and your peace, God. Come and have your way in our lives, Lord.